Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the One Gold Sales and Marketing Manager at AppMex. One Gold is a platform that provides direct ownership of vaulted gold, silver, and platinum at an ultra low cost. It's Levi Gunter. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Yes, happy to have you back. A lot has transpired in the gold and silver market since we last spoke. Obviously, gold hitting all-time highs. People very excited when it comes to 2024's action. Give us your take on what has transpired so far in the gold and silver markets and what you think are the main catalysts that have been driving the price. Yeah, a lot has happened you know, since the last time we spoke, which I believe was around November of, of 2023. So um, at, at that point, gold had recently broke above the 2000 mark following the um, October 7th attack on, on Israel. And, and I believe at that time, we called out several potential catalysts for gold as we head into the new year. Um, key among those being the potential for a Fed pivot. And in addition to that, continued geopolitical, uh, geopolitical uh, upheaval, right? So um, in, into 2024, we've certainly seen those two emerge as primary drivers this year. Uh, when the year started, uh, there was an initial expectation of, I believe, three interest rate cuts. So it was really that sentiment combined with, you know, news out of the Middle East that really drove gold. And I would argue the latter, again, that geopolitical piece has, has been kind of the most significant driver. And, and, and again, if you look at the chart, the gold chart in this case, it really tells that story. So gold clearly had its best days, its most significant gains during times when Middle East news was sort of dominating the headlines. And you can even look, you know, here pretty recently back in April uh, when Iran launched the missile and drone attack into Israel, I believe for the first time ever directly from Iranian territory. And, and so at that point, there was kind of the concern that this regional con conflict may really expand into something more broad. And, and so as a result, gold was at an all time high at, uh, during that period of about 2430 which would have been about 17% higher year to date. And then what you saw after that is, is gold corrected to some degree because things sort of calmed down in the Middle East, tensions eased, and also the forecast uh, for interest rates kind of changed as well. So that brings us to where we are today, which I believe gold's around 2,300 an ounce, which is about 12% higher year to date. Um, pivoting to silver, it has a really similar story so far this year. Um, Looking again back up several weeks ago when gold was at an all-time high, silver was at its own two-year high near $29. It, it kind of failed to breach that $30 mark, uh, but again, driven by really the same factors that gold was in, in geopolitical events. So we're, we've corrected to de some degree today on silver. I want to say we're about 10% higher, which would be about $26.50 um, an ounce. And so when it comes to geopolitical tensions, rising global conflict, Obviously, this has an impact on both the price in gold and, and silver, as you've just outlined. I wonder, over the long run, do you think those can continue to be drivers for both? Because as you mentioned, some of the initial fears about the Iran and Israel conflict, whatever you want to call it, sending missiles back and forth, would erupt into a larger global conflict that would draw in the U.S. and potentially other, other countries as well. Now that that, at least for the moment, doesn't seem to be happening, do you think that puts downward pressure on the price of gold? Do you think that central bank buying has played a role and could continue to play a role? Are there other catalysts and drivers that you think that make you long-term bullish on gold and silver? Yeah, long-term, certainly I look at central bank buying and over the past couple of years, you know, we've hit record numbers there. And I want to say in, over the past couple of years, if you look at overall gold demand, um, uh, over half of that is accounted for by central bank buying. And, and I don't know why they would slow anytime soon. In fact, they've done polls of central banks and, and it's and it's interesting. They buy gold for the same reason the individual investor might. It's a hedge against inflation, against certain currencies like the US dollar. Uh, so that's been a major contributor, especially for gold. I don't see that slowing down. Um, and, and there are a variety of other events. I still look at geopolitical events as sort of a key component to that. 
uh, over the past couple of years, we've had a lot of that. So if you rewind to a little over two years ago, uh, when Russia first invaded Ukraine, you know, gold broke a, above 2000 for the first time in a couple of years. Uh, last year, gold's gains were largely attributable not only to um, banking concerns, but to a greater degree, again, geopolitical events, uh, upheaval in, in the Middle East. And, and so what, what happened then? Well, gold gained about 11% in 2020, making for its best year in over three years, while the Fed, mind you, was actively raising interest rates. So I think interest rates are certainly a factor. But, uh, you know, again, just looking at the data, geopolitical events have certainly, in my view, kind of made, made, made for some of the more sustained uh, movements up for, for gold specifically. And where do you see the Fed going from here in terms of potential rate cuts? It feels like we're in a higher for longer environment, inflation remaining very persistent. Uh, we all know that the CPI print is a joke anyways. They, they doctor the numbers so much. They're talking the 3% or something like that. Inflation is far, far higher when you're your average consumer going to the grocery store to buy food for your family. They're not seeing the, those same numbers. Um, where where do you think the policy is headed there? Because it seems like they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. It seems like higher interest rates is not really addressing this sticky inflation. So how do you see things unfolding from here? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's anyone's guess at this point. So as I mentioned a moment ago, we were forecasted for three rate cuts this year. And now that's been delayed, uh, given like what you said, persistent inflation. Um, today, I think the Fed's expected to announce that they're going to hold rates steady. So that's not going to be a surprise there. Um, one indicator I like to look at, and it's been pretty reliable, is the CME Fed Watch tool. Uh, and if you look at that, it casts doubt on any rate cuts until late in the fourth quarter of this year. So if you look at December, according to the, the FedWatch tool, we're at about a 75% chance of a rate cut by that point, provided inflation you know, doesn't continue to run hotter. Um, so like I said, I think it's anyone's guess. Um, it's been incredibly difficult, as we all know, to get inflation, as stated by the Fed or using their preferred gauges, to get below that that kind of two percent target rate, so and, and I don't know that necessarily continued rate cuts or rate cuts in general are needed to sort of sustain the bull market in in gold. Um, again, just look at what happened last year. I think one rate cut would be beneficial because at least for gold's sake, because that would kind of signal a, a pivot in overall Fed policy. Uh, but as far as where we're going from here, if I had to venture a guess, probably one rate cut this year. And if it doesn't happen, I don't think it's the end of the world for gold. Yeah, I, I also think eventually they might just move the goalpost and say, actually, guys, 4% inflation is is good for you. It's good for the economy. It's more realistic. <laughs> the consumers, yeah. yeah, the consumer's doing well despite this. Um, now, I want to pivot to Japan for a moment because the Japanese yen continues to weaken considerably having lost around 20% of its purchasing power over the US, against the U.S. dollar over the last year. Um, now, those holding gold in Japan have seen it act as a real safe haven as it continues to climb to all-time highs in that currency, really protecting purchasing power, doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, what do you make of the situation in Japan right now? Could this be the straw that breaks the back of the global financial system? Do you think it will remain an isolated uh issue to that country specifically what are your thoughts yeah that's a i think it's a complex question right and um i'll do my best to, to answer that and i'll preface it by saying you know i'm by no means an expert on on japanese fiscal policy but some things are obvious to me if i look at uh, the genesis of this situation it, it it goes quite a ways back um as a lot of your audience knows at one point, Japan was the second largest economy in the world. And what they've seen since then, since about 2010, when they were surpassed by China and eventually uh, Germany, was stagnation in their economy. So if I'm looking at what's driving kind of the decline of the yen against the U.S. dollar, to me, it seems it's driven primarily by the vast difference in our interest rates. Uh, so we've been kind of trying to accomplish two different goals, okay? So here in the U.S., we've been fighting inflation and price increases by raising interest rates. So as a result, the Fed's benchmark rate here in the U.S. is 5.25 to 5.5%. 5 
in Japan, they've again been doing sort of the opposite where they're trying to encourage uh, wage growth and overall growth. So the Bank of Japan's equivalent rate is zero to 0.01 percent. So, you know, e easy money. Right. And, and what that means for investors, at least in Japan, is they have other opportunities elsewhere. And to some degree, that's, I would say, been exaggerated in recent months with kind of a, a perceived at least delay, if not cancellation and rate cuts here in the U.S. So I think we've seen that kind of exacerbate the issue with the yen. Um, it, it's kind of hard for me to sort of opine on the ramifications of that for, for the Japanese citizens, although it's, it's pretty obvious the you know, purchasing power has been significantly diluted. Um, and natural solution to that, at least for them, has been gold. You know, I look at gold uh, ETF lows and they've been strong in Japan since 2020 and at times have run in contrast to global ETF flows. So at times when there have been global outflows of gold ETF, the, the, the Japanese are, are still buying gold. So um, all that to say, I think it's pretty intuitive. I think it's probably, you know, why you own gold in, in the first place, right? Absolutely. And when it comes to retail participation in the gold market in the West, I've spoken to a lot of people who say it's not really happening to the extent that it is in places like China and places like Japan um, and India, other places around the world. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think, first of all, what are you seeing from your side at Atmex? I know you you uh, deal in physical precious metals there. And do you think we could eventually see the Western retail investor kind of enter the market in a more meaningful way up ahead as all these things we've been discussing re regarding the economy kind of make themselves apparent even to your average person in the street? Yeah, great question. And, you know, I may be a little biased. I think gold is is vastly underowned here in the U.S. And, and one gauge we like to use, again, are our ETF inflows and outflows. Um, and at times what we've seen here at Atmex and, and One Gold is when you have major outflows or net outflows rather of, of ETFs, we're still seeing strong buying here at, at Atmex and, and One Gold. And I think you could attribute that to a few things. I think in general, people are maybe getting a little more skeptical or actually careful, if you will, about how they invest. They want to know their, their funds are, or their metals are insured. They want to actually own the asset. So um, kind of circling back to answer your question, you, we're, we're still seeing strong sales here. I don't know how that applies to the more broad picture. Um, probably the, the trend I'd call out mostly at this point in time would be the buyback situation. So given recent price increases, um, both Atmex and One Goal, you know, we're seeing customers liquidate in, in record amounts and but sales are still strong at the same time. So kind of an interesting trend there. Very interesting. Now, I do want to pivot to One Gold now. I know that both yourself, I spoke to Patrick from your company previously as well. You're both advocates for owning physical precious metals as well as vaulted precious metals through a platform like One Gold. I'm wondering why you think someone should have access to both, to both vaulted and physical. What What's the advantage there? Yeah, that's a good point, especially when you say both. Um, I think a lot of people think maybe it's one or the other. And I don't want to come across like I'm giving a sales pitch. So I'll, I'll more so kind of relay what we're hearing from our customers. And, you know, for context, I would say many, actually most of One Gold customers who are engaged on our vaulted platform also own physical metals. But we hear, you know, feedback from them. And, and a lot of it has to do with, um, I don't know if I had to boil it down to three points, uh, three or four things. Security would be a big one. Okay, so... Um, many people who own gold are comfortable hold, holding it in their home. I am to some degree, but we all know that's not insured and it's not insured at your, you know, bank deposit box or something along those lines. So at, at which point you're not comfortable is sort of up to the individual. Is it $10,000? Is it $50,000? You know, when I, I speak to a lot of our customers, many of them have six or seven figures invested into, into precious metals. And at that point, you really want to know your assets are insured. So I think that's been kind of a big sticking point for some is they just want to know that their assets are insured. And we have a solution for that at One Gold. We use a company called Lloyd's of London, which you may have heard of. Um, and another thing I hear quite frequently has to do with cost and cost in terms of premiums. And, and premiums 
may not be top of mind if if somebody's kind of newer to the space. Uh, but it's definitely something you, you've got to consider. You don't want to give away too much in fees, in other words. Um, and that's what we hear an awful lot from our customers. If I just take, you know, for example, the most popular product here in the U.S., the, the Silver American Eagle for, for silver, for example. Um, if I were to put, let's say, $10,000 into Silver American Eagles today, it's something I own. Um, but also were to put the same $10,000 into one gold, I'd actually get about 30% more silver for my money uh, just due to the premium differential. And I'm just kind of looking at the average premiums across the industry for, for Silver Eagles. And, and again, that's a, a point uh, that we're hearing from our customers is, hey, I want to own the metal. I don't want to give away too much in fees. I want an exposure. So many of them will get into uh, one gold and hold long term or eventually redeem, you know, into a physical delivery, you know, as premiums tend to, to sort of normalize. Um, and then I would probably call out the, the sort of convenience factor, specifically as it pertains to liquidity. Like I mentioned a moment ago, we're seeing a lot of um, buybacks here. And, and, you know, if you own physical metal, if you've ever tried to sell physical metal, you know, there are some obstacles there and, and frankly, some risks. And, and just going through the process, you know, if you are lucky, lucky enough to have a, a dealer in your area who will who provide you good pricing, well, then that's a pretty good solution, right? But I would venture to say that most of us don't really have that luxury. So now you're left with, you know, calling a dealer, arranging pricing over the phone, even shipping product. And I know that if you have a, a lot of silver, for example, that can be cumbersome. So uh, once again, our customers who own physical like one goal because they can sell with just a few clicks at a known premium and basically withdraw their cash on, on the same day. That's a very good breakdown of, of reasons why to own both. Um, I do want to switch to storage locations. I think some people have concerns about where the metal is being held specifically because we've seen how quickly both politics and geopolitics can change. So people are wondering about what's a safe jurisdiction to store the metal in. Um, what countries do you store your metals in and how do you determine if the jurisdiction will be safe for the long run? Yeah, interesting question. Um, I am probably like maybe the majority of our customers at One Gold. I, I store metal here in the US, uh, elsewhere also, but and I think that's probably a function of one goal being a U.S. company. There's some comfortability there with storing, you know, relatively close to where you live. But if you ask anybody else that question, you're going to get, and I know from experience, a lot of different answers. It's going to vary to great degree depending on their outlook for a general, for an area, geopolitically speaking. Um, so if you're not comfortable holding metal in the U.S., uh, you know, we offer storage locations in Canada. And if you're not comfortable with that, then maybe you will store in Switzerland or the United Kingdom. But uh, me personally, I don't mind holding gold here. But again, not everybody shares that view. And that this is sort of why we offer multiple locations. Yeah, that, it's very interesting because people will look at Canada, for example, and say, well, look what they did when they froze people's bank accounts. Is that really a safe jurisdiction? People will look at Switzerland and say, well, they're supposed to be a neutral country historically, and now they're kind of siding with Ukraine in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I mean, I don't think that necessarily has an impact on on metal that's vaulted there, but it it makes people hesitant a little bit. So I think it's, it's good to have many options when it comes to the jurisdiction where the metal is stored. Uh, now, One Gold was founded by Atmex and Sprott. So could you also give us an overview of Atmex? We touched on it a little bit earlier, but maybe give us some more detail there. And then could you talk about how that partnership came together and what it means for One Gold customers? Yeah. So for those in your audience who are not aware, um, Atmex is the largest uh, physical precious metal retailer here in the U.S. Uh, they've been in business for over 23 years now. Um, they have something like north of 18 billion in sales. So I would say they're one of the more larger reputable companies here in the U.S. for physical metals. Um, and, and they partnered, as you mentioned, with a company called Sprott in 2018 to form One Gold. And, and basically Sprott is an alternative asset manager uh, based out of Canada who specializes in gold and silver ETFs. So the goal was to sort of find a middle ground between the two. Uh, that's a, kind of a more modern, intuitive um, option to actually own physical precious metals. And that's what One Gold is in a nutshell. So uh, basically, as you mentioned earlier, you know, customers can buy metal on One Gold. It's vaulted gold, silver, and platinum. 
and they can choose to store it here in the, in the U.S., the United Kingdom, Canada, or Switzerland. And that's just kind of what it is in a nutshell. It's, it's sort of designed to be a middle ground solution that gives customers kind of the same convenience and low fee structure that you may have with an ETF, but also the, the, the peace of mind knowing that you actually own the metal as well. And I want to touch on crypto here for a moment because it seems like a digital platform such as One Gold, if not in competition with the crypto market, at least perhaps is trying to attract some people who are investing in crypto. Um, I thought the craze had largely died down. I think crypto and Bitcoin are two very different things. That's not a conversation we need to get into here. But I do consistently see people posting meme coins, pumping meme, coin, meme coins on Twitter, for example, and it's getting thousands of likes and all these people are chiming in on what their favorite meme coin is, which blows my mind. This should be the sign of a top in the market. But again, that's another conversation for another day. Um, how does one goal look at potentially capturing that demographic and kind of, for lack of a better word, making it cool to to own digital precious metals. Do you guys think about that segment of the market at all? We do, uh, you know, and it's interesting. I, I think it mostly boils down to education. Um, and, and all too often I hear, you know, Bitcoin versus gold, uh, you know, it's one or the other. And, and in reality, I think they're two entirely different assets, right? So when I think of of crypto and Bitcoin specifically, um, that, that's a highly volatile asset. Um, you know, the, the similarities kind of in between the two of sort of their decentralized nature. And after that, they're, they're totally different. Um, to me, you know, you've heard it said that, you know, Bitcoin and crypto in general are more highly correlated with like tech stocks, for example. So to me, that's more like a risk on asset. I'm not going to, in other words, buy uh, crypto as a hedge against the dollar or Bitcoin as a hedge against the dollar. On the same token, I'm not going to buy gold and expect the same kind of volatility um, as I would when I buy Bitcoin. So I think they serve two totally different functions. And we're, we're sort of, you try to address that just through education. You know, it's not necessarily Bitcoin versus gold, but maybe Bitcoin and gold, if, 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 if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to circle back to a more broad economic question that I was beating to ask you. And that is the comparison that some are making to the current economic era with the 1970s, an era of stagflation, where commodities and gold vastly outperform stocks, bonds, and the dollar. Do you see persistent stagflation as a possibility up ahead? Do you think there are parallels between now and the 70s? And could we see a similar performance from gold? Yeah, interesting question. Again, I think um, we have the ingredients for that now to some degree, right? We have slower growth. We saw some sort of weaker than expected GDP data as early as last week and inflation's still on the rise. So you certainly have the makings of that. And if I look at our situation today and in some ways, yeah, I can mirror what happened in the 70s. I think that a lot of folks in the 70s thought at one point the Fed had tackled inflation. And what you saw was sort of a second wave of inflation as that increased from around 1976 to 1980, uh, you know, gold went on this massive run. It went from about 180 an ounce to about $850 an ounce, which would be about a 360% gain, right? Um, I think we could see that to some degree here where inflation, we thought maybe at the beginning of this year had been tackled. Uh, we can move on. We can have a Fed pivot, uh, but not so much. We're seeing kind of inflation persist. I don't know if it's a second wave per se, but yeah, I think you could easily draw some parallels there. And, and long term, if that continues, I think it would be ultimately bullish for gold. Well, Levi, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, before I let you go, do you have any final words you want to share on the One Gold platform? Well, yeah, definitely appreciate you having me on again, Jesse. It's always a pleasure. Um, you know, if folks are interested in One Gold, it's easy to find. You can find it online at onegold.com, so onegold.com, uh, or you could find the app uh, for download in the App Store or the Google Play Store. Great. Well, I'll put a link to that in the description below for people who want to check that out. Thank you once again, Levi, for coming on and sharing your knowledge with the audience. My pleasure. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.